we know that the systems can be different. It's not like, you, you know, you have one single recipe that you can apply it everywhere, but there are as well different tools and different approaches that you can use to do the elimination. Um, if you are doing, for example, for example, uh, hair closure for purse virus, then if you want to do mycoplasma elimination on top of that, then you have to think of, you know, how you need to change this a little bit, tweaking that and um, adding more days to that closure, using some antibiotics at the end, maybe doing the um, gel acclimation at the beginning, you know, like it's not going to be so very simple, but it's doable. And it has really helped many producers and uh, systems in the United States to get to that point. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. And joining me on this week's episode is Dr. Maria Peters. Dr. Peters is an associate professor at the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine in the Department of Veterinary Population Medicine. Maria, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. If you would, why don't you start with an introduction for the audience? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and share, um, you know, our, our investigations with your audience. Um, like you said, I am an associate, associate professor at the University of Minnesota. I also have um, some appointment with the Diagnostic Laboratory, Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory, and I am the director of the Swine Disease Eradication Center at the University of Minnesota. Farm Health Guardian is a proven biosecurity software system that helps you improve compliance and reduce disease risk. Why choose Farm Health Guardian? Automate downtime and health status management for large systems. Get biosecurity breach alerts for trucks and trailers. Prevent unauthorized access to your barns with controlled entry technology. And speed up disease investigations with automated traceback reports. Check out what our customers are saying at farmhealthguardian.com. Maria, you are certainly well recognized as one of the world's premier experts in mycoplasma. Uh, and we're going to cover that on the podcast here today. Um, we're going to start by talking a little bit about mycoplasma nomenclature. And I know that may not be the audience's most exciting part of this, but hang in there. Like I promise that's not the whole part of this. But I hear some scuttle, Maria, that there is at least discussions of potentially making a, an adjustment to the name of mycoplasma. You want to give us a brief update on what that is that that would be great and and actually it's very timely because this is something that is happening as we speak right and um several years ago i would say what six five years ago there was a proposal a publication for a new classification of all mycoplasmas because it's, this is all one genus and there are so many species in there right and there was this proposal different names in our mycoplasma the one we're talking about today will be mesomycoplasma hyaluronemone. However, the International Organization for Mycoplasmology uh, did not agree with that nomenclature. And now there is, you know, back and forth, there are publications rejecting that nomenclature, nomenclature and uh, things are still ongoing. There was a recent meeting of the organization and um, every time there, there is one of these meetings, there is more and more discussion. But what is important to us right now is that you can find it in the literature right now as mesomycoplasma hyaluronemone or mycoplasma hyaluronemone. Both names are correct to use right now, and they both refer to the same bacterium, the one that causes insoluric pneumonia and pigs that we have known for over 50 years. Excellent. So it sounds like at least in the short term, we can't get it wrong. We can use either name and we're still correct in the short term. Exactly. <laughs> Very good. Well, let's get on the applied side, Maria. Um, eradication of mycoplasma has been a very growing trend in the United States industry, and I think producers all over the world are going to find uh, they're going to they're going to jump on that trend when they find out how nice it is to have pigs that don't cough in finishing. But talk a little bit about mycoplasma elimination, um, and in particular, um, you know, is it uh, is it something that producers can do concurrently with PERS elimination and maybe kind of uh, kill two birds with one stone? So to say. 
Yep, that's that's really good to talk about because in reality, in the United States, the way that we, you know, that the production sy- systems work and the way that we do eliminations is a little bit different as it could be in other countries. Mycoplasma elimination has been going on in other countries for you know, several years since the 80s, right? And there are at least three countries that claim to be negative to, to the agent. But here in the States, more recently, we have worked uh, a lot on this. And I would say that, uh, you know, piggybacking on the mycopla- the purse eliminations that has been mycoplasma, and that has served very well for the elimination of this agent, right? We know that the systems can be different. It's not like, you, you know, you have one single recipe that you can apply it everywhere, but there are as well different tools and different approaches that you can use to do the elimination. Um, if you are doing, for example, for example, uh, hair closure for purse virus, then if you want to do mycoplasma elimination on top of that, then you have to think of, you know, how you need to change this a little bit, tweaking that and, um, adding more days to that closure, using some antibiotics at the end, maybe doing the um, guilt acclimation at the beginning, you know, like it's not going to be so very simple, but it's doable. And it has really helped many producers and uh, systems in the United States to get to that point. Um, I mean, like we could easily, you know, start counting the peop- the, the different uh, companies that are working on elimination. And you will be amazed of how many of them have been able to get rid of mycoplasma in most of their system by doing this. And um, of course, you know, like we're talking here pretty quick and we don't have time to, you know, go in depth into each one of this, the, the methods, but um, there are different ways uh, to skin a cat. And um, the same, we can talk about, you know, fast elimination, slow elimination, using vaccine and antibiotics or just a closure, you know, like different ways. Or you can go the, you know, the way of uh, depopulation, repopulation. That would be the, the, the main one we think about when we talk about elimination. But there are other ways that you can, other methods that you can apply in a, in a manner that place better with other uh, purposes that you can have for the elimination at the farm and then being able to do uh, that control. In reality, you know, when I talk about elimination, this is this is the uh, ultimate form of control for mycoplasma high pneumonia. Uh, when we are doing regular control, you know, like you can uh, work with vaccines or antibiotics. Traditionally, we have been doing that we know that we achieve partial control. You can get things, you know, very well going on at the farm and you can see the differences, but that would always be partial control. So to be able to get rid of the agent, you will have to think of, you know, elimination. Um, More recently, and I would say in the last uh, decade or so, we have been working more on management and how we can get to control combining you know, management, um, vaccination, and and antibiotic treatment. So we need a little bit of everything because there is not a single way to get uh, to the um, elimination endpoint. But um, the management of the guilt actually has been like really something that has changed. We have understood a little bit better, you know, like the epidemiology of the agent. How does it move from one type of groups you know, populations or ages to another and where are the routes of transmission, how it happens more often. So with all that, we have been able to, you know, slowly put together some sort of, you know, like the puzzle, trying to put it together to get a better picture on how to, or, you know, what are the the weakest links there? And then so we can go to these points and in being able to control uh, the disease and and the agent in, in, in pig populations. The weakest link is, I think, a wonderful point of discussion here, Maria, because um, we have resources, right, whether they're management strategies, vaccines, antibiotics, but applying those resources at the right part of the epidemiological chain is so important. Talk to us a little bit about how a producer or a veterinarian can use diagnostics to identify those weak links. How, what can they test? How can they test it to say, okay, from the time that I get control of my guilt until my finishing pigs are closed out and marketed, how can I use diagnostics to hone in on where is the weakest link in my chain at my production system? 
Well, I don't think we're going to have time to cover all that, right? But, you know, I'll try to just uh, summarize a little bit about what we... Um, how we see diagnostics these days uh, for Michael. And we have, you know, learned so much in the, in the recent years. And I would, I would argue that we have improved dramatically diagnostics for mycoplasma. And, um, and, and I can really see, you know, like the practitioners being critical and saying, you, we need better tools. We need easier tools. And I know, um, it would be ideal, but some things we know that they don't work very well for Michael and well, you know, we have to approach things in a, in a different way. For example, um, there are tools uh, or methods like the oral fluids. And we know we have been trying, you know, like for many years, trying to make them work for mycoplasma and they, they don't quite do the job. Okay. And um, I think at the end of the day, it's about what you need to know for mycoplasma. Like, for example, if you do an elimination program, then you want to confirm that you have eliminated, right? So you will have to um, go to those populations that you think are going to be the ones um, at highest uh, risk and then collect samples that are going to be really sensitive. And for that, I would say, you know, tracheal secretions, collecting tracheal secretions, it can be swabs or it can be catheters, whatever you use, right? But then getting to that point, because you know that's where the bug is going to be. Um, we have learned over the years, even though mycoplasma is a bacterium, Bacterial isolation is not the answer for this agent, right? Because it's, it's really difficult to be detected. We know serology um, can be complicated for interpretation because, uh, you know, we use vaccination because the immunity to this agent is not strong enough to evoke a very good uh, serology that we can recognize right away. So for all those things, um, the use of serology can be limited. We have learned that um, with uh, PCR testing, we have been uh, more sensitive, but depending on the sample that we use, we can be um, you know, way off in that sensitivity. Um, we have also learned more recently that um, you know, detection of mycoplasma from the environment, like from environmental contamination, can be an issue. So because of that, we need to make sure that those the samples when they are collected are not, you know, like really contaminated or potentially cross-contaminated from the environment. And more recently, we have developed a viability PCR, which is a different type of PCR, it's an mRNA-based PCR, to be able to say what we are detecting here is potentially alive and infectious. And I would say, you know, that in a nutshell, that's what we uh, where we are at with the diagnostics for myco these days. But um, I know this is very brief and uh, there will be other questions. So I, I invite the audience to, you know, read or to reach out to um, your pathologist, uh, your diagnosticians, to your diagnostic laboratory, so you can get more information about the best use of the tools that are available and in, in how to apply those. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. You mentioned a, a newer tool there, Maria, the viability PCR. Is that commercially available at the Minnesota Diagnostic Lab today? Actually, not yet, but um, at this point, it's still in the research um, uh, laboratory. Uh, we have published that and we are learning how to use it, right? But, you know, understanding when you're doing guilt acclimation, is the material that I'm using really, you know, uh, the, the one that I'm thinking it's it's going to infect those animals or when I'm detecting it in some animals after, uh, you know, an elimination program, is that just contamination or is it the life, Michael? So that's, those are the type of questions that we are applying it to right now. But for now, it is at the research level. Tremendous information. I think it's very helpful. Uh, Maria, you always do a wonderful job of shining a light in the black box that is mycoplasma challenges. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and being a part of the show. Thank you very much for the invite. Well, thanks to the audience. Uh, we appreciate you joining Maria and I. Please subscribe to the podcast. For Dr. Maria Peters, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thanks for being with us and have a great rest of your day. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health-related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, 
please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at W-I-S-E-N-E-T-I-X dot com.